o'clock, so I think we'll make a start now. So good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar this afternoon. Before moving on to our speaker, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Keith Barmer, Commercial Communications Specialist at the Fisher Scientific Channel. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2019, we put together a programme of webinars to share with our customers, and we are continuing to offer exciting and informative webinars to help keep you informed and engaged. You can view our upcoming webinars and revisit the previous ones by going to our webinar webpage, which you can access using the link in the programme section of our homepage. And you'll also find it under events and exhibitions, which is at the bottom of our main web landing page. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar today so it can be made available on our website later. Now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague Michelle Newton, another commercial communication specialist at the Fish Scientific Channel. Michelle is here with me today and will tell you how our question and answer session will work. Over to you Michelle. Thanks Keith. Um, good afternoon everybody. Um, so as Keith explained I will be your chat master for today's webinar. Um, you have entered the webinar on mute, um, but you will be able to unmute yourself at the end of the presentation um, to ask Simon any questions that you may have. Uh, you can also ask questions as we go through the presentation using the chat function, um, and we'll also cover these at the end. Um, to ask your questions, please click on the red arrow, which allows you to hide or expand your control panel. Um, so I will hand you back to, back to Keith. Thanks, Michelle. So today we're joined by a supplier colleague, Simon Pierce from Thermo Scientific. Simon is a senior product manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, overseeing the products used in organic synthesis within our fine chemicals business. Simon joined Thermo Fisher as a synthetic chemist in 1984 as part of Maybridge and has over 35 years of experience in the chemical industry. So now I'll hand over to Simon, who will run through today's presentation. Okay, thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, for that uh, nice introduction, and to all of my colleagues in, in the Fisher Scientific Channel for the opportunity to present the webinar today. And the topic is how, by selecting the right chemicals, you can accelerate your drug discovery program. So we have over 80,000 different uh, chemicals in our fine chemicals portfolio, um, and they are many different applications. Uh, ranging from pharmaceutical industry to renewable energy, such as batteries. But today, the focus is gonna be on drug discovery and the chemicals we have in the portfolio that assist our customers who are doing research in this area to discover new drugs. So <clears throat> I'm gonna begin by, by just speaking about the, the first maybe two years in a drug discovery workflow. So these products are used early on in, in drug discovery. So Moving from left to right, you can see in the far left of the slide, first you have the validated target. That, that will be the disease that you're trying to treat. Um, and obviously there are many different diseases uh, and biologists work to try and understand the disease mechanism, how it attacks uh, the patient. And then they try and discover uh, chemicals that will interact in a positive way with that uh, disease target. Uh, and obviously the, the hope will be that we can cure the patient uh, of the disease or at least um, prevent the disease from getting worse. Uh, and in order to do that, we develop a, a test that is called an assay, uh, and these are developed to screen different chemicals against the disease target and to see which ones uh, have a positive impact. And we'll cover that uh, in, the, in the first part of the presentation. So this is a process known as HIT identification. Uh, and in HIT identification, you screen different chemical libraries against the disease target. Uh, and in this instance, we'll talk about um, the process for that and how our thermoscientific scientific Maybridge screening libraries are used in this part of the drug discovery workflow. And then after HITs have been identified, then there's a process called HIT to lead and lead optimization. And again, our products uh, form uh, a key resource in this area too. Um, and, and I'll demonstrate uh, how, how these products are used in, in that function. Um, and, and here we have the Thermo Scientific Building Blocks and the Thermo Scientific Chemical Probes. So those will be the three groups of products that I'll be covering in today's webinar. Okay, so let's begin with 
the hit identification step. So uh, high quality screening libraries can evaluate a diverse range of existing drug structures and commonly use scaffolds against new disease targets. And this is where our screening libraries come into play. So what is the HIT finding process? So HIT finding can be characterized as a search for compounds that combine to targets and result in an action that produces a therapeutic result. So it's like throwing chemicals at a disease target and seeing which ones stick to it. So then the questions become, how good is your target? How well can you screen? And how good are your compounds? So let's begin with the target. So to find a valid target, what is a target? Well, a target is a protein or biomolecule implicated in a disease pathway. And if we intervene with this protein, we would expect to be able to cure or alleviate the disease. And we have a lot of understanding today about the different proteins that are implicated in different diseases. So for example, the alpha synuclein protein is implicated in Parkinson's disease, snare proteins in type two diabetes. So then we, we have to screen against the, the, the target. So the testing of a series of molecules against the biological target is known as screening, screening or assaying. And it's a reliable and systematic measure of the potency of potential new drugs. And it can rely on, on high automated or high throughput screening technologies. And there are two different types of assays that are generally used. The biophysical assay, which involves uh, using techniques like NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, or crystallography, or surface plasmon resonance, which is also commonly referred to as SPR, or you have the biochemical techniques, which often rely on fluorescence detection technologies. And these lead to two very distinctive screening processes. The first, which is more traditional, the high throughput screening, or HTS, is activity-based. And then we have fragment screening, and fragment screening is structure-based. And I will explain the differences between the two processes in the coming slides. So let's consider high throughput screening or HTS. So in high throughput screening, we screen generally very large numbers of compounds, tens of thousands, potentially millions of different chemical compounds against our target. And we look to see if any of those compounds bind to the target protein. And if you look at the, the sort of structures uh, on, on the schematic at the, the bottom of the slide, you can see that what you're really looking for is uh, a compound that, that fits into the pocket in the protein. Uh, so it's the right shape. So often when I describe this um, to colleagues, I, I talk about uh, it's like you have a complicated lock on a door uh, and you're trying to find a key that fits the lock to open the door. And screening is, is like having a whole stack of keys of different shapes and sizes and you try each one in the door one at a time and you try and find one that kind of fits and that's really your hit that's your starting point because once you've discovered one that kind of fits then you can build uh, the hit to lead program to actually refine that key so eventually you have a, a key that completely fits the, the lock you can put it into the into the lock and turn it and open the door and that's the drug that you're trying to find so high throughput screening is really trying to understand what shape of key uh, that you need to to uh, to bind with that protein pocket fragment basically discovery on the other hand um, is you're using smaller compounds and you're trying to understand how the smaller compound fits into that protein pocket so you're not trying to find a solution all in one go you're trying to work it out piece by piece, um, building up an image of uh, what fits where, so that ultimately you can build up uh, a picture of the, the, the total um, compound that you're going to need that will uh, bind with the protein target. So unlike the, 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 the lock and the, the key analogy I used in the previous uh, slide to describe HTS, this is more like trying to uh, understand the combination of a safe so you're trying to kind of figure out uh, number by number uh, which, uh, which sequence to use um, to build up a picture of, of the complete sequence and then you can open the safe. So it's a, it's a, it's a different approach to the same uh, problem, but it has some advantages. So um, fragment screening, uh, you find the small parts that bind and then grow or merge the fragment to create the hit compound. 
but you can also deconstruct HTS hits. So you can kind of break HTS hits up to try and understand which parts of the key are fitting and which aren't, and then kind of build up a better picture of what the ultimate lead compound of the drug is, is likely to, to look like. So it can suggest interactions to exploit in the hit to lead optimization phase. Uh, so the two are complementary to one another, uh, and uh, but but you need different libraries of compounds to to do both. And uh, and under our, our, our Maybridge screening libraries, we have both HTS and fragment screening libraries for our customers to access. So <clears throat> the second, aside from the, the, the technique you're going to use, obviously the, the compounds themselves are really important that, that go into the library. So often you hear words like drug-like compound. So what do we mean by a drug-like compound? Well, a drug-like compound ha has to have high efficacy. It's got to do the job at the lowest sustainable dosage. No one wants to take an enormous pill and swallow it every day. It has to be selective. You want it to target the disease, not to, uh, not to do anything else. You, it shouldn't be toxic, of course. You don't want to poison the patient. There should be no or minimal side effects, short or long term. And it should get fully metabolized and excreted without problem. You don't want the, the drug to be staying in the body. Um, it's going to be unique because you have to patent it because drug discovery is enormously expensive. Uh, it takes a, a billion, something two billion dollars, about 10 years uh, on, on average to discover a new drug. So um, you're going to want to patent it and, and recoup that, that uh, all of that money you spent uh, when you market the drug. And it's going to survive eight to 10 years of clinical trials. And it's got to be scalable because if you're going to have a successful drug, you're going to have to manufacture a lot of it. So the chemical process, the synthesis of the, the, the drug uh, also has to be something that you can, you can make it scale. And then finally, last but not least, it's got to be formulatable, by which I mean it needs to be uh, in some kind of mechanism to provide it to the patient that they can take it. So it could be a tablet that they, they swallow or a, uh, an aerosol spray. Um, or, or water, but there has to be some way that you can formulate it and, and put it into a dose that the patient can take. But as well as drug-like, screening compounds have to be hit-like. So what do we mean by a hit-like screening compound? So our Maybridge Library collection actually has a very high degree of hit-like compounds, so we can use those as an example here. And there was a great paper by Tegatel um, that summarised the ideal hit profile of compound. So it should have a C log P value between one and three and a molecular weight between 100 and 350. And the information in, in the two um, charts below shows the average distribution of molecular weight and C log P in our major screening libraries. And you can see that actually uh, they're very clearly fall within the, the, the right types of parameters to be considered hit-like. Uh, and the collection also demonstrates classic characteristics of drug-like molecules. So there was a, a very famous paper written in the 1990s by a guy called Chris Lipinski, who, who uh, kind of summarized the, the, the rules, which were a pragmatic reduction of common features of the drugs represented in the World Drug Index. So he said, uh, he, he, uh, he claimed that the rule of five, if, if, you, uh, if the compounds kind of fulfilled the rule of five, it would make them, uh, at least give them a, a great possibility to become successful drugs and many for many years the rule of five has been used by a medicinal chemist to describe the sort of physical chemical properties of hit like and drug like molecules now that being said um, there may be a need to change definition of drug like properties so um, back in 2019 um, just before we were unable to to go to face-to-face -face conferences anymore i i uh, went to a, a medicinal chemistry conference in, in hatfield in the uk and I listened to a guy called Michael Schultz from Novartis. And, uh, he published a paper in, in 2019 in Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, uh, and he analysed um, all of the, uh, the, the, the drug like or, or drug discovery programmes that had happened over the past 20 years uh, in the two decades since the Rule of Five was introduced as the concept of, of drug like properties. And so he examined all of the, the drug parameters of the of the both the, the drug discovery, kind of the, the candidates that went into clinical trials and, it, and all the successful drugs that had been developed over that, that period of time. And his analysis demonstrates that while some parameters such as C log B and H, C log P and HPD remain constants, molecular weight, for example, has increased. So you can see from the, the chart actually uh, over more uh, recent decades, 
drugs have become more complex molecules. Um, so he put, hypothesized that perhaps um, yeah, this meant that uh, molecular weight is not a drug-like property at all. And if Lipinski had done his analysis in the 1950s, perhaps it would have been his rule of four, or today the rule of six. Um, but um, it, it's interesting that uh, much as, as much else in life, um, things have got more complicated in recent years. So if you want to learn more about our Maybridge screening libraries, both for high throughput screening and for fragment screening, we have a, an excellent brochure that covers the features and benefits of our thermoscientific Maybridge screening library. So um, you can learn a lot more from, from that. So we've, we've got our hit, so now we need to do our hit to lead optimization. So this is where, again, another section of our chemical compounds come to play and a diverse collection of chemical building blocks can enable high quality structure activity or SAR research. So this is where uh, we examine the, the, we're changing the structure, whether we increase the activity of the chemical against the target or not. So we're after a successful high throughput screening program where we've identified our hits and actually, you know, from a, I mentioned the very large numbers of compounds in a typical HTS program could be uh, starting by tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands. In some instances, large pharmaceutical companies screen millions of compounds, but they might actually only get a handful of compounds that show potential. So it's a very small number generally of hits come out of the, an HTS program. But once you have your hits, they, they represent the start of another process of design, uh, synthesis and testing and interaction between the, the different molecules uh, and the, that have been created and, and the target. So you can see this sort of cyclical process it involves both medicinal and organic chemistry um, and the bio, biological evaluation of the molecules that are, that, are, that are presented. So it's continual kind of work between the medicinal chemists who are, are looking to try and understand how they can adapt that that key to make it more more efficient to uh, to open the lock um, the organic chemists who are synthesizing the molecules um, based on the, the design that they're being passed um, and it's really a kind of a, a collaboration between the the, uh, the chemistry colleagues and the biology colleagues to try and uh, to, to, to build through this process uh, and ultimately spin out a candidate that can be developed into a, into a lead uh, that can ultimately go into clinical trials. And this slide gives an example of hip to lead opt optimization. So this is a, a molecule, uh, this, is, this is actually the drug furizomide, which is a treatment of congestive heart failure and edema. And it's, it's commonly marketed by Sanofi Aventis under the brand name Lasix. And you can see that this drug consists on the left-hand side of a heterocyclic ring, a furan ring, and that's linked by a, a linker um, to, to the, uh, the, 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 the sulfonyl amide um, core, the carboxylic acid, the, the, uh, the chlorine hanging off there. So this is the, during the hit to lead optimization pro program, they would have changed the linker, they would have changed the heterocycle, and this would have sort of modified the molecule um, chemically, um, and then they would screen that against the target to find out whether the molecule was was more or less active. And obviously, this this ultimately became the the most you know successful molecule, went into the clinical trials, and became the the drug furosemide. So this is where the organic synthesis part of our portfolio comes into play. So uh, a lot of our uh, customers uh, are actually conducting organic synthesis, but for those who may not be that familiar with organic synthesis, um, organic synthesis is very much like following a recipe in cooking. Um, so we have what we call building blocks. So building blocks are starting materials with functional groups that can be used to construct more complex molecules. So typically a, a customer will select the building blocks that they require to build the, 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 the next molecule that they're looking to make. Uh, and then in order to, to get them to react together, typically you need the appropriate functional reagents. So these are also chemicals, but these chemicals uh, allow the transformations of the building blocks into the target molecules quickly, safely, and cleanly. But you also need to create the right conditions, and that often are what we call, you know, use essential chemicals. So more chemicals in this case could be solvents or bases or salts. These, uh, for example, if the building blocks are too solid, maybe you need to dissolve them into a solution so they'll react more efficiently. 
and then you need a solvent. So solvents, another group of chemicals that are, that are used in organic synthesis. And then finally, um, the purification. So once the, the reaction is completed, you'll be a very lucky chemist indeed if all of the two uh, starting materials are converted into your final product. Typically, there will be some side reactions that occur. You'll need to purify the product, remove the impurities. Um, that involves more chemicals again, of course, and um, the analysis uh, finally will tell you whether you have the right, the right compound you set out to. Uh, so maybe you use infrared or, or NMR spectroscopy or LC or GC um, chromatography techniques, but, but, but these will, will actually uh, qualify, tell you if you've made the right compound and quantify um, you know, what percentage purity it is. So that's the, the final step of the process. All of these things are involved in, in organic synthesis and we have all of those products in the portfolio many uh, medicinal and organic chemists using those in early phase drug discovery. And this is a really busy slide, but it's an example of organic synthesis. So if you're an organic chemist, it's probably a fairly easy slide to understand. If you're not, it's probably quite a difficult slide. But on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the recipe. This is the list of ingredients that are used to, to synthesize. In this case, the drug remdesivir. Remdesivir has become quite uh, sort of famous over the last two years because it's one of the drugs that's been used to treat the, the COVID-19 um, virus, as, as you may be aware. Um, and remdesivir is, a, is what is known as a small molecule drug. Um, and you can see the structure of remdesivir at the bottom on the left-hand side. But you have to synthesize remdesivir, you have to start with the building blocks. The building blocks are the top of the left slide, the, the first two building blocks you can see there. And they're reacted together. There's a line to the right, and you can see TEA and DCM. So TEA is triethylamine, DCM, dichloromethane. These are the reagents and the solvents for the reaction. Naught degrees to room temperature over 12 hours. Those are the conditions. And then that you synthesize compound A on the right, the more complex molecule. And then in parallel, there's another synthesis beneath it, uh, which again um, yields compound B and, and so on and so forth. And you can see that actually you know, to synthesize the, the, the drug remdesivir involves a lot of chemistry, a lot of different chemicals. Uh, and the interesting thing is that if you look on the right hand side again to the list of chemicals, you can see all of our product codes, all of the CAS numbers. So all we have, um, all of these, the products that are necessary for the synthesis. And we're um, just using this as a demonstration of the, the, the reason that, you know, when I mentioned at the beginning that we have 80,000 chemicals in our portfolio, which might seem like a lot, it's because you know, there is a lot of chemicals required in organic synthesis, uh, and we, we make sure that we have all of those uh, that the customers who are doing this work may need. So some of the, the, the key differentiators, so some of you may be, uh, or may be aware of the brands that we used to sell our fine chemicals under. So we used to uh, have Across Organics, Alpha Azar, and Maybridge. Um, but uh, last year, in November last year, we migrated all of our products under the Fermo Scientific brand. And this makes it a lot easier to talk about the products holistically and for the customers to kind of understand it's a single portfolio. And that portfolio has a lot of different features that really differentiate it from our competitors. So we have building blocks, we have functional reagents, we have the catalysts, the essentials, and those products for purification and analysis. And some of the key features, so some of you may be aware of our Acrosil packaging, which is used for liquids that are particularly air and moisture sensitive, um, we have in the building blocks range really large selections of key building blocks that are used in medicinal chemistry. So boronic acid is important for, uh, because they are used in the Suzuki chemistry for carbon-carbon for bond formation, really important organic synthesis. Um, we have heterocyclic compounds because they, they can really improve the pharmacophoric profile of the, of the compounds um, from a drug discovery perspective. Uh, about 80% of, of drugs have heterocyclic compounds in them. And then fluoroaromatics, aromatics, because fluorine can also um, be an important uh, uh, aspect in, in, in making a drug more stable or making it more potent. So again, um, a range of different um, building blocks that are really uh, focused on um, the medicinal chemist. And we have many organic and organic metallic compounds for synthesis and a really great range of catalysts. So, Together, we have a really strong uh, offering in the organic chemistry space. And in that offering, we have over 30,000 chemical building blocks, over 5,000 reagents for organic synthesis, actually more than 50 years experience in offering precious metals, including a wide range of catalysts and all of the basic essentials 
including solvents, acids and bases. And we have a great new flyer that we produced um, a year or so ago that, that talks about the organic synthesis of antivirals. Um, and it's, uh, it's just, we, we picked that because there was a lot of, obviously a lot of focus uh, on, on antiviral compounds and, 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 and antiviral research uh, that was being conducted or still being conducted today. Um, but uh, we just thought that um, this would be an interesting topic uh, for people to, to read and to just demonstrate the breadth of the portfolio for this, this area of research. So then if we want to take our, um, our lead and then optimize it, um, so what are we talking about here? Well, with one of the, the, the tools that we have in the, the chemical portfolio for lead optimization of chem, so-called chemical probes. So these can reduce the technical or biological risks of pursuing the wrong pathway or target before commencing clinical trials. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what, what chemical probes are and what they represent. So chemical probes represent an important component of both academic and pharmaceutical drug discovery research because they reduce the technical or biological risks of pursuing the wrong pathway or target before commencing clinical trials. So chemical probes are essential in the validation of new molecule molecular targets for therapeutic indications. What does that mean? Obviously, clinical trials are really expensive and and can take you know, a number of years to conclude. So if you begin cl clinical trials without really understanding the mode of action of the, of the, the potential new uh, target or new drug that you, you, you have, um, you might have some sort of unfortunate surprises during the clinical trials and the, the, the compounds may actually drop out of the trials and you've lost all of that investment and time. So if you can understand the mode of action of your potential new drug first, you have a better chance that um, that you will make it through the clinical trials without um, having to, to see your, your prospective new, new drug fail. And um, so there's a big difference between drugs and, and, and chemical probes. So drugs must be safe and effective. You're giving them to patients, of course. Um, and they must, they, but they may, they may not have a defined mode of action. They might have passed through the clinical trials. Um, they, you didn't understand the mode of action, um, but you were lucky. You, you, you got through the clinical trials successfully and the drug is being used, but you don't really understand how it works. Um, drugs have typically intellectual property restrictions and maybe limited availability, um, but they must have human bioavailability. So there's, there's a high bar for the physical chemical properties of, of, of drugs and pharmaceutical properties, because obviously you're, you know, you're manufacturing them on a large scale, you're, you know, they've got to be stable enough to be kept on a shelf in a, uh, in a pharmacy and, and then distributed to the patients. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a list of properties of, of what, you know, what drugs must, must have is, is a high barrier. Whereas probes, they're there to ask a specific biological question. So we need to know the mode of action. We need to know how that um, chemical interacts with that target. Um, they need to be selective because we, we need to use them to identify a specific question about a specific piece of biology. Um, they have to generally have drug-like properties, um, but the bioavailability part isn't necessarily required. But it's really about um, asking a specific biological question. So um, that's the, 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 the big difference between drugs and probes. And um, we've recently introduced uh, a new range of these chemical probes into our chemicals range, specifically for um, medicinal chemists and, and biologists who are developing new drugs. So we've got, um, there's actually a community, a really great um, resource is the, uh, the chemical probes portal. So this is actually being developed by researchers in the cancer research community. Uh, it's currently being led by a lady called uh, Dr. Susanna Muller Knapp. Uh, who's director of operations at the chemical probes portal and she actually provided a webinar for us last year um, on this topic and um, she worked with us to to uh to develop a nice brochure on chemical probes which give a lot of information about the different um proteins that the probes are are used for um so some some really uh, interesting information in the brochure for uh for customers who are looking at um validating their, their leads before they take them into clinical trials. Another part of the, the puzzle that is the drug discovery process. So we've talked about the, 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 the complexity of drug discovery, the fact that it can, it can take 
um, many years, maybe 10 years to develop a new drug, uh, $2 billion of, of, uh, of, uh, of money or investment. But there are some shortcuts. So one of those involves repurposing existing drugs to new disease targets, which can accelerate the search for new treatments. So I'm not sure that this works in any language but, but English, but we have a saying in English that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But in this instance, we're trying to teach an old drug new tricks. And um, drug repurposing is the practice of using existing licensed drugs for new medical applications. So it helps, of course, to reduce costs and it encompasses different things. So drug repurposing could involve repositioning drug candidates against a new target. So you might be looking at one disease, but then you shift to, to looking at it as, a, as an opportunity to, to treat another. Or you can target drugs that have been abandoned or failed um, and, you know, because you have some new knowledge or there maybe there's an, a new target that you want to, uh, to take that, um, that drug towards. Or you can target marketed or off-patent drugs, or you could reformulate drugs to include novel delivery systems. Um, so you know there are there are now uh, many modern new ways of of delivering uh, drugs. So there are all sort of nanotechnologies that have been developed, where where um, drugs can be um, directed to to, to um, the right uh, portion of the patient. Um, so there are there are different opportunities there. And then finally, last but not least, you can identify combination therapies. So maybe a mixture of of different drugs taken together can you know, uh, be a treatment. So all of those things uh, involve uh, you know, uh, what we could be called drug repurposing. And we saw that really clearly uh, with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic because um, basically we, we didn't have a lot of time. We needed to, uh, to try and repurpose the drugs that we have. We didn't have 10 years to start a screening program Although screening programs have begun, and there are many, many current research projects ongoing um, for, for treatments into, into the coronavirus, but repurposing drugs was certainly one of those that was, um, was really picked up on early um, because it allowed us to tackle the pandemic and it could also potentially be applicable to future pandemics. And internationally, there's been a, a multi pronged approach and they've tested over 300. Um, drugs against that, that, um, that, that COVID-19 target. And um, why? Because small molecule drugs are cheap and easy to produce in large quantities. So it's more affordable for less wealthy nations. Obviously there's, there's a huge amount of effort went into the vaccines and we got vaccines and that's fantastic. But also, you know, another way of, of treating the patient if you're not able to vaccinate them is to, to give them the drug once they, they've caught the disease and, and the, the drug um, tackles the disease and makes the patient better. So uh, it's, it's certainly, you know, again, um, uh, a, a way that um, we can treat patients that's, that's alongside vaccines really important. So um, there's been a lot of effort in, in terms of identifying drugs that can tackle COVID-19. So some of the, uh, the 300 drugs being trialed or have been trialed on this slide. So remdesivir, which we've already seen um, in the organic synthesis part of the, the, the talk, was developed by Gilead to treat Ebola, and that seems to prevent the replication of the virus. So that's being used as a, as a treatment. And amantadine, which was used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, has also had some success. Ribavirin, which was an antiviral medication that was used to treat hepatitis C, uh, also, uh, again, has had some impact. Lopinavir, which was an HIV med uh, medication, which we actually had as part of our portfolio, um, so many of these, these compounds actually exist in our kind of life sciences part of the portfolio where we, we sell a lot of these products in for research applications and a lot of these were purchased for uh, research just in, in, in this instance for, for looking at, um, at targeting the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. And then dexamethasone, which is a small molecule drug that's used in the treatment of many conditions including rheumatic problems and some skin diseases and some severe allergies, including asthma. Again, another in our portfolio, and then hydroxychloroquine um, and uh, bemcentinib, which was actually a brand new anti-cancer drug, which was still in clinical trials, developed by the Norwegian biopharma company, Virgen Bio. 
and there's further research being carried out. Um, so recently, uh, researchers at the Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute in California screened a library of compounds that are known as the Reframe Library. So this is a, a library of actually 12,000 known drugs um, so uh, to treat uh, the COVID-19. And they actually found 21, including remdesivir, that showed antiviral activity. And of those, there were 13 they believe could be given to COVID-19 patients. Four drugs were especially promising because they could be used in combination with the remdesivir itself to, to, to treat. And that combination was, was more potent than the individual um, drugs on their own. And dozens more drugs have been tested and, and failed to treat this, obviously, this devastating respiratory infection. So it does leave the field wide open for additional treatments and, and obviously thousands of patients badly in need. But we did have a, you know, a recent success, the dexamethasone um, here, the, the structure on the right. Um, and you can see the name. I'm not going to try and read out the name, uh, but you can see why they called it dexamethasone. It's quite a, a long name, uh, its chemical name, but it, it was claimed, it's being claimed it reduces the risk of death by a third for patients on ventilators and for those on oxygen by a fifth. So to put that in perspective, if the, if the drug had been used to treat patients initially in the UK, it's for up to 5,000 lives could have been saved. And the drug is already prescribed to reduce inflammation and a range of other conditions, including arthritis, asthma, and some conditions, and is now prescribed on our national health service for COVID-19. So this is a, a good example of drug repurposing and the impact it can have. So from our perspective, uh, as suppliers of fine chemicals, um, it also means that life scientists need chemicals too, not just the organic chemists and digital chemists, but actually the biologists and the life science researchers. We have a whole range of different bioactive molecules in our portfolio. These are molecules that can or could be used as drugs in human and veterinary medicine or, or in research and development, which is how our customers use them. And as a chemical supplier, we focus on the so-called small molecules in contrast to proteins and antibodies that are supplied elsewhere within the Thermo Fisher organization. And many groups, our well, main groups of bioactive compounds in this small molecule category are drug-like molecules, antibiotics, which also include antivirals, antimycotic and amphomimphic products, and some signal transduction reagents, such as enzyme inhibitors, activators, and channel blockers. And we've got, again, a very nice brochure here on the right uh, this one is specifically on the antiviral compounds, but because for some strange reason, our customers have been particularly interested in antiviral research recently. So we brought out this, but, but we do have a lot of other products uh, that are also targeting other diseases uh, and uh, other parts of the, the life science spectrum. Okay, so um, I'm going to finish the, 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 the presentation by, by talking about what does actually success look like. Um, so um, this is an example of a successful anti-cancer drug that originated from our Maybridge screening collection. So this is the, 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 uh, the drug Labrip, or uh, it's commonly known or marketed as Limpaza. So actually the, the Maybridge business was, was founded over 50 years ago, um, and there's been numerous success stories documented in, in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, about hits that originated from the Maybridge libraries that, that ended up going into clinical trials and ultimately the highlights that caused actual drugs that got their starting points from the Maybridge screening collection. Um, then these include Celebrex, Nexafar, Student, and most recently Elaborib. So Elaborib, um, trade name Limpaza, was approved by the FDA in December of 2014 for the treatment of ovarian cancer. So um, the compound from which this drug was developed came from the Maybridge screening collection. So there were a group of scientists uh, at Cambridge University, and they were looking at a particular enzyme, uh, an enzyme called PARP, which is a uh, poly-ADP ribose polymerase enzyme, and that's an enzyme involved in DNA repair. Um, and they re realized that if they could um, interact with that, that repair mechanism, they could make cells more vulnerable, uh, particularly cancer cells, um, more vulnerable, um, and they could be used in combination with you know, other um, approaches, such as um, chemotherapy, um, to, to target the cancer cells and to, uh, to give um, you know, patients a, a better outcome from, from that particular disease. 
Um, and in particular, it, it acts against cancers in people with this hereditary mutations in what are known as the, the BRCA1 or BRCA2 um, mutations, which includes many patients that develop ovarian breast and prostate cancers. Um, so this is the fourth drug that has been identified as being developed from the Maybridge screening collection. So the compound on the left at the bottom was the HIT, and that HIT um, came from the, uh, from, from the Maybridge screening collection. And then there was the, the HIT to lead optimization process I talked about. There was a lot of chemistry done um, and, uh, and ultimately the, the lead compound that went into the clinic is the compound on the right. You can see the kind of basic frame of the, the structure it's a heterocyclic compound. I talked about the importance of heterocycles. It's got a fluorine on it. I talked about the importance of fluorine often appearing in, in, in drugs. So um, it's, uh, it, it, it features some of the, the sort of key components, if you like, of, of, of uh, successful drugs. Um, and this compound, uh, ultimately, um, the, the Cambridge scientists formed uh, a biotech company called Qdos Pharmaceuticals. And Qdos worked with the, the team at Maybridge the, to uh, develop um, where they handled the biology and we handled the chemistry. They, they, the uh, success attracted um, venture capitalist funding. They were able to, to build their own chemistry uh, team. Ultimately, at the, the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca acquired um, the Qdos company just for this drug. Uh, and then they progressed it through the clinical trials. Um, what is interesting, um, it's, uh, it's uh, a highly successful for drug now um, for, for AstraZeneca. And Merck uh, recently acquired half of the rights to this drug for $8.5 billion. So um, that gives you some uh, uh, sort of uh, idea of the, of the value of this drug and, and, and how you know, uh, successful drug discovery programs can, can obviously, if you, if you uh, if you get the, the, the right drugs, it could be really a major success from a commercial perspective. But I also wanted to, to cover what I believe is more important of what success looks like. So um, this, this um, on the left-hand side of the slide was taken from uh, a BBC uh, article that was written about um, two years ago now. And this uh, was the, the, uh, published by the Drugs Advisory Body, um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK. And they said that using a lab rib as an early stage in the treatment of, of um, ovarian cancer would bring the greatest benefit to patients and may have actually the potential to cure the disease altogether. And in the trials, they, they had nearly 60% of patients receiving the drug did not see the disease progress and they, they got any worse after three years compared with just 27% of patients that were taking a dummy drug. And they believe that maintenance treatment with a lab rib heralds a new era for women with ovarian cancer. And this is the first time we've seen such dramatic improvements in progression-free survival. Um, this was the comment from Dr. Susanna, Susanna Banerjee, who's the consultant medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. Uh, and she was involved in the, in the, in the trial. So, and then there was an actually um, a statement by a lady called Florence Wilkes, who was diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer in, in 2010 when she was 46 years old. And she experienced some symptoms such as extreme tiredness and backache for a couple of years. And then she was diagnosed, she was given 12, between 12 to 18 months to live, had two major operations, four rounds of chemotherapy, was told that really she didn't have much chance of surviving much longer. Um, you know, and obviously that was, was, was uh, something that was really very difficult in that position, she said, you know, it was horrific. Life was going to be so, her life was going to be so short. And then she started taking the elaborate drug. And she said, you know, without this drug, I wouldn't be here. I'm so grateful for it. I didn't think I'd get to see my daughter's 21st or my son's 18th. These are major milestones. So this really is what our drug discovery, this is the successful outcome of drug discovery. So yes, it's a multi-billion um, successful drug, but actually, you know, it, it's all about um, you know, making patients have a better quality of life and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, extending their lives when they, when they get these uh, terrible diseases. So, I mean, this is a really great um, success story and something that, uh, you know, we're very proud of the fact that Maybridge Libraries play such a key role early on in, in uh, finding this new drug.
so in summary, um, I just like to finish by saying that, you know, discovering new drugs can be a long and extremely expensive process, but our, through our thermo scientific made which high throughput and fragment screening libraries, we offer really great hit finding tools as the starting points to new drugs. And we've already um, had some, some major successes and our researchers around the world continue to use those libraries to, to, you know, to, to work with uh, on their drug discovery campaigns. But also our portfolio of thermoscientific chemicals enables the customers to access both the bioactive molecules themselves, but also the means to synthesize them in their close analogs, which is really important in a drug discovery program. So that you know, ultimately together with our customers and the really exciting and important work that they're doing, we can really help them accelerate their drug discovery process. Um, okay, so I think you'll want to, um, uh, this next slide is really about providing you with the resources um, within the, the, the Fisher Scientific website that we've got that gives you all of the information. So all of these resources that we've talked about today are available. Um, uh, clearly, there's a, there's a lot of information there that you can access. Um, so, so hopefully that will be um, you know, great, a great asset for you to be able to, if you want to learn more about any of the topics that we've covered on the webinar today, that you'll be able to, uh, to source them through the, the Fisher Scientific website. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Keith and Michelle um, to, uh, I think Michelle, you're going to be fielding the questions. I am indeed. Um, so thank you, Simon, for that informative session. Um, it was really liked that example at the end that kind of shows that just the difference this, that, you know, that this kind of thing makes in people's lives. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a few questions for you. Um, so the first one we have is, what developments do you see happening to improve the success rate in HIT identification? Yeah, thank, thank you, Michelle. That's a, a great question. So um, actually, one of the things that really is, is becoming more and more important is artificial intelligence. So we, we hear a lot about artificial intelli intelligence in other areas of, of, of uh, you know, our lives. But AI is really is really going to be, I think, going to be driving a lot of drug discovery um, innovation going forward. So, what do I mean by that? So, actually, one of the you know I talked about screening, physically screening millions, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of screening compounds, and that actually takes a lot of resources to actually screen, physically screen those compounds to try and. But we don't know, right? We don't know what the lock looks like. We have to by many different keys, but what if AI can help us, if they can really examine the lock and kind of theorize what the key should look like, then we can, we can maybe feed in millions of theoretical compounds into an AI program, and then the AI program tells us, right, maybe you screen these, these hundred, maybe these thousand, maybe these 10,000, but not the hundreds of thousands, not the millions. And the compounds that because we can explore theoretical chemical space much quicker than real chemical space and because these compounds haven't yet been created but will need to be created after the AI has kind of informed us that these are the compounds we need to test and maybe they can accelerate the drug discovery program uh, you know, significantly and make us a lot more successful then there are a lot of companies including really big companies like Google and Amazon that are really working in this space and trying to develop software that is kind of predictive of, of, um, of identifying new drugs. And I think that's a really exciting area and something that we'll, we'll see more and more happening in the future. Okay, lovely, so watch this space. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you very much. So the next question that we have for you is, what are the most common organic synthesis reactions used in medicinal chemistry? Thank you. So yeah, that's another another good question. It's one of those strange things. As as um as Keith mentioned at the beginning, um, I've been involved in the chemical industry for about thirty five years. I started as an organic synthesis uh, chemist. For the first twenty years or so, I worked in the lab. I managed uh, teams of chemists doing organic synthesis, and we we did a wide variety of different chemistries, we made lots of different um, uh, compounds, but actually uh, the, the core chemistry, the synthesis techniques didn't change that much. There have been a few in my career.
career where there's been the kind of the adoption. Um, we used to use a lot of carbonyl chlorides or acid chlorides early on. Um, React them with 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 amines, um, but they were quite reactive. They were unstable. They weren't easy to use. And then some um, some coupling reagents were kind of discovered that meant that we could use carboxylic acids, which were much more stable. So amide sort of coupling chemistry, which which was which has kind of evolved. The Suzuki, the the carbon carbon bond formation. Um, you know, the, the Hex Suzuki. Um, they they won the Nobel Prize for that. Um, you know that's really important. But what I think is interesting in, in medicinal chemistry is probably at the core of kind of library synthesis and creating the libraries of compounds for high throughput screening. Probably is typically kind of six really important um, reactions that, and probably the biggest of those are, are things like the, the sort of the, the amide coupling reactions, Suzuki chemistry reactions, um, and they haven't changed that much. And that's one of the reasons why um, you know when we're developing our chemistry portfolio, we make sure that we've got all of the key chemicals that are required for those reactions within the portfolio um, and, and focus in on what we kind of know that the, the customers are, are looking for. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, but it's interesting to me that although the molecules themselves are ever more sophisticated and they have more and more different applications, at the heart of it, organic chemistry hasn't changed too much over the last 35 years. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, and the, the final question that we have in the chat is, um, how do you decide which building blocks to include in your portfolio? Yeah, thank you. It's a, another, another good question. So, I mean, I mentioned during the talk that we have over 30,000 uh, building blocks in the portfolio and people might think, well, that's quite a lot. And and it is, but nevertheless, um, I guess if I was to look at the commercial space for chemical building blocks, what could I actually grab by today? There'd be easily several million um, building blocks that could be could be purchased, could be acquired by from different suppliers. And the the reason, I mean, there's you know, obviously the the, 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 the the almost kind of uh, indefinite number of building block potential building blocks. So no one no one can offer every building block. So we have to focus on what we believe are the most important building blocks for our for our customers. So, um, and I mentioned some of that in the in in the talk. So we we focus on building blocks with the most important functional groups. So we look at the you know what are the, what are our customers doing? What chemistries are they doing? They're doing we know they're doing Suzuki chemistry as an example. That's important. So we really try and have as many different boronic acid building blocks as possible. So that's an important functional group. But there are probably 12 or 13 different other functional groups as well that we we regularly look to to include. And then we look at um, heterocyclic rings, for example. So we want to have as many different examples of different heterocycles within the building's block portfolio, because if you're doing medicinal chemistry, changing the heterocycle is often a good way to change the, um, the, 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 the structure in, in, a, in, a, in an SAR program to give you more potent molecules. So you'll want to kind of uh, change different heterocycles or swap them out. So we, we try and have as many different heterocyclic rings. And we'll look at um, isomers. So the building block um, should have the functional group in different positions on the heterocyclic ring so that you can explore sort of chemical space um, when, you're, when you're doing medicinal chemistry. So we're thinking about all of those things Fluorine is important on often on, on building blocks. So we include a lot of fluorinated compounds in our building blocks portfolio. So collectively, you know, we, we do it, we do a lot to try and um, uh, this, of all those potential millions, we're really quite selective in terms of the building blocks that we introduce into our portfolio. We really think hard about the chemistries that our customers are doing and what they need of the building blocks um, in the research that they're they're, they're carrying out. Um, so you know, there, there's there's um, it's certainly not a, a, a random process. There's a lot of thought that goes into trying to, to ensure that we have a really relevant portfolio. And if we're going to include 30,000 building blocks, uh, it's all of the common products that we, we know that our customers use on a regular basis. And for the rest, it's products that we think they would find interesting and appropriate for the research they're doing. Okay, that is lovely. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody um, on the call have any questions for Simon? Um, 
you just want to click uh, uh, to unmute yourself on the, the control panel. No. No, but so I, I, I think that's it for the uh, for the question uh, and, and answer session. So, Simon, thank you again from myself. That was really, really informative. Um, I'll just hand you back over to Keith. Thanks, Michelle. A bit of an echo on the on the call, I think. There, um, anyway, I, I hope you could get that okay. Um, we've come to the end of our webinar this afternoon, so I'd like to thank you once again for joining, and also to thank our presenter Simon for a very interesting and informative session, which I found enlightening. And, and thank you for those questions also. Um, before leaving you, can I just remind you to keep an eye on our webinar page to look out for webinars that might be of interest to you in future as well as the recording of today's session. And now have a great afternoon and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye, everyone.